This is Dr. Mark Hyman, and this is a place for conversations that matter. And I believe that today's conversation is going to matter to all of you because it's about how to beat disease through food. And today's guest is an extraordinary scientist, physician, speaker, author. He's uh, a guy I met a number of years ago and have been very impressed with and recently had the privilege of listening to him at a Milken Institute conference roundtable on food, which brought together all the leaders in thinking about food and health and disease, including food companies. And he gave a dissertation that was off the cuff that literally blew my mind. And in that, he elucidated the power of food in terms of treating disease. And he showed a slide that I pretty much have been blazoned in my mind, which showed the effect of drugs on various biological systems through very fancy chemical analyses, and then the effect of foods on the same systems. And almost every time, the food was more powerful than drugs. And really, that's why I wanted you here, Dr. Lee, because he's uh, not only written this book, which I want you all to get, called Eat to Beat Disease, The New Science of How Your Body Can Heal Itself. And this is really the science of health as opposed to treating disease, which we all learn as doctors. He's best known, though, for his work leading the Angiogenesis Foundation. Now, those of you who don't know what that is, this means how you grow new blood vessels. And particularly, we focus on it around cancer because cancer needs new blood vessels to grow, and they love to create new blood vessels to feed themselves. Well, we don't want that to happen. So he's really done groundbreaking work on this, but not only around cancer, but 70 other diseases are affected by angiogenesis, including cancer, diabetes, blindness, heart disease, obesity. He did an incredible TED Talk called Can We Eat to Starve Cancer, which had 11 million views, which is impressive. He's been on The Oz Show, Martha Stewart, CNN, MSNBC, NPR, Voice of America. He's been at the Vatican talking at the Unite to Cure conference. He's authored over 100 scientific pub publications and leading journals like the New England Journal of Medicine, Science, Lancet. These are the top tier journals. He's been on the faculty of Harvard, Tufts, Dartmouth Medical School. And, and we are so lucky and privileged to have him here today on the Doctor's Pharmacy. Welcome, Dr. Lee. Well, thank you, Mark. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, I know that we share common passions and really trying to understand health. And that's what I'm all about and uh, love to uh, have this conversation. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. You know, we've got a, a guy like you who is steeped in deep academia, who's been published in major medical journals, who's been at Harvard, Tufts, and Dartmouth, is leading the field in the world of angiogenesis, uh, which is an extraordinary field of cancer treatment and reversal. And yet somehow you took a kind of sideways turn and realized that, wait a minute, we are in medicine focused on treating disease. But what happens after you do that? Or maybe there's a better way to actually reverse disease, which none of us in medical school were taught was possible, and actually create health. How did you make that sort of shift in your head? Well, or maybe I, it was your heart. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's always a little bit of both. Uh, look, I trained as an internal medicine doc. And so my DNA, so to speak, in thinking about patients is really um, young and old, um, healthy and sick, men and women, uh, children to adults. And so that gives me kind of a more comprehensive view. But the other thing about my background is that I'm a, a scientist, I'm a vascular biologist. And so I go a mile deep into, you know, really kind of um, a significant science. And I wanted to bring those worlds together. Uh, 1994, so 25 years ago, I thought that um, what a contribution I could make was to create a nonprofit organization called the Angiogenesis Foundation, whose mission would be to do something unusual, which is to look at common denominators of disease. So rather than look, take one disease and then just study it a mile deep, what I thought was, what are the things that unite diseases that are common? And could we find some interesting connections that would allow us to not just treat one disease, but maybe pull the bow back and send a single arrow through multiple diseases. Yeah, That turned out to be angiogenesis, how the body grows blood vessels. And that led me onto this journey where <clears throat> when I saw patients, I started to think through, well, how do blood vessels normally keep people healthy? And then what happens when they go awry? And that unites 70 different diseases. As I practiced, I started to realize that, you know, we were mostly chasing sickness. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, the work of my organization, we um, help to uh, 
help lots of different groups um, come up with 32 FDA approved drugs and treatments, all of which are important, but all add to the unsustainability of our model of healthcare, yeah. which is waiting until the end and then trying to kind of intercept with more expensive treatments for people that are sicker. And I thought, what if we use this common denominator approach to look at health? Yeah. What unites health? And that's what led me to write the uh, Eat to Beat Disease. Uh, and I realized that there was this remarkable new universe for health that we can actually explore. Well, look, most of us actually don't think too much about our health when we're going around, you know, getting, as we're younger, growing up, going, leading careers, et cetera, starting families. But in fact, you think about health when you lose it. Right? So that's basically what we see as doctors when we see our patients, they're concerned when they've lost their health. And it seems to me that if we can help more people stay healthy, but really use science, not guesswork, not conjecture, not um, soapboxing. And, and I think this is where science comes in. Uh, you and I have talked about this before. There is good, hard science that can help us understand the body. And yes, we were not taught this in medical school, but we should be. Because the science of health is really the future of medicine. It's 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 really powerful, and that's what functional medicine is. And yeah. coming from your perspective, you know, we've come at it from the clinical perspective, which mm -hmm. is, you know, we're seeing these common things. We we try to create health by changing the diet, by optimizing the microbiome, by improving the immune system, by improving your energy and your mitochondria, helping you detoxify, balancing your hormones, you know, dealing with your lifestyle factors. These are the ways in which we create health. And it's it's pretty rudimentary, I would say. I mean, functional medicine is is awesome clinically, but we're just at the infancy stages of really understanding this. And you come at it from the deep science point of view. And and that and you come to the same conclusions, which is pretty awesome. So let's talk about uh some powerful new drugs uh that have been discovered that can affect angiogenesis and that actually <clears throat> may be able to reverse many diseases. What I was talking about was green tea and soy and red wine and grapes and tomatoes and fish oil and broccoli and oranges and berries and, and pomegranate and curcumin and green leafy vegetables and papaya and Chinese cabbage and artichokes and garlic, right? Mm -hmm. These are the new drugs. And you write about this. And there was a beautiful article you wrote. It was in a Journal of Oncology called Tumor Angiogenesis as a Target for Dietary Cancer. Cancer prevention. Now, most people are going to have trouble reading it. I, I certainly was was dense for me. But what you did was you mapped out the deep science around the power of all these different compounds and foods to help reverse disease. So, as a scientist, you know what's nice about science is that it is um, truth, and we follow truth wherever it goes. And basically, the route that I took is. Um, there's a lot of research that leads to the discovery of new um, drugs by the pharmaceutical biotech industry. I've been there, done that, still involved with it actually, and it's because we have more sick people that need better treatment. So that's valuable by itself. It's not and either or. It's not either or. And you know, I'm certainly not one of those doctors that have sort of rejected Western biomedicine. Like it's very important no. when you're sick to help save lives. On the other hand, what I realize is that there's a missing opportunity, and, and that opportunity is what everybody sort of intuitively knows, which is that the things that we put into our body can affect our body, and they affect our cells. And food as medicine is really not a new concept. It's an old concept. And if you go other cultures, whether you're in Europe or you're in Asia, indigenous uh, peoples uh, from all around the world, they looked at food as part of their health keeping. Mm -hmm. scorecard and they viewed food as a precious substance not you know they didn't just eat to survive they mm -hmm. ate because they were doing something good for themselves we've lost a little bit of that and the research behind it actually resurfaces this in a new way that i think that we can all get behind which is not in fact it's not really just about the food it's about how our body responds to the food yeah how does our body protect its health? And that's what the health defense systems are all about. It's true. I, I remember uh, traveling once in Hong Kong, and I went out to dinner with this guy. I think it was part of Merrill Lynch. I gave a talk. And we had this extraordinary meal, and everything in the meal was medicine, intentionally medicine. And I wrote an article about <clears> it called <throat> Eating Your Medicine, Food is Pharmacology. And then I went through all the dishes we had, and I went through the research, and I was like, well, Ginkgo nuts do this, and you know this thing does that. And it was just an amazing 
kind of uh, experience because I realized that in this culture, we don't think of food that way. And yet that's, that's foundational for creating health. Well, that's why I wrote Eat to Beat Disease. <clears throat> Uh, is that, you know, while I do explain the science behind things, I actually lay out more than 200 different foods that are actually, some of them are real crowd pleasers. They're the things that we actually know that are supported by science and then figure out how can you incorporate that? Because in fact, um, it becomes natural to pick the things that are good for you. It's, it's something we've lost that we can bring, put back into our everyday lives. And for me, when I uh, go out to eat or when I prepare a meal, that's what I'm doing. I'm actually assembling things that I know are good for me. Mm, absolutely. That's why this show is called The Doctor's Pharmacy with an F, F-A-R-M-A-C-Y, exactly. because that's where you get your drugs. I go to the drugstore, which is the grocery store, and that's where I find all the drugs. And I literally don't know as much as you perhaps about this, because uh, even though I've been doing it for a long time, but I look at all the vegetables and all the foods. Now, I, I didn't know razor clams, we're going to get into that, <laughs> are so beneficial. I don't know exactly know why, but I love them. But you can find out what are the foods that have various components right. that can activate health. Right. And how do you eat more of those things? Well, I think it makes it, it's about having knowledge uh, and then making it second nature, right? Mm -hmm. So when we heat up something on the stove, we know it's gonna be hot, we don't burn ourselves. So we actually mm -hmm. avoid certain behaviors. When we go out into the sun, we know to put on sunscreen, it becomes second nature. I think food as medicine is something that can become second nature. You have to be exposed to the basic information. And you know, the science is important because that's what makes it real. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day is, you know, this is something that school teachers should be teaching kids, mm -hmm. that at coaches should be teaching athletes, that doctors should be um, telling patients. And so, and I think family members should be uh, sharing among themselves. This is the type of conversation that should be happening at every holiday meal uh, in every schoolyard. And, and I think that it's not so foreign, it's informed by science and we can all do it. It's true. No, and the other thing I, I heard you say was at this conference was you showed a slide around immunotherapy. For those of you who know what immunotherapy is, it's essentially a way to um, get cancer by activating your immune system rather than giving a poison or cutting it out or burning it out. Right. You literally give something that's going to help your immune system get into gear and be like Pac-Man and eat up the cancer. Uh, and you showed a slide, and, and who would have thought of this, but you showed a slide that People who respond to the key, this immunotherapy, and, and these literally can erase cancers, actually have a certain type of bacteria in their microbiome, in their gut, that makes them respond to, the, to this immunotherapy. Whereas those who don't actually <clears throat> die. And, and this bacteria is called Ackermansia. It's one of the you know, thousands and thousands of species of bugs in your gut. And you shared a story, if, if I may, about your mom yeah. who had basically metastatic endometrial cancer, which uh, was treated with immunotherapy and was successful, but you added certain things to the treatment to, to make sure that her acromancia were good, like pomegranate and cranberry and these polyphenols, right. which come from food that seem to be powerful growers of these great bugs in your gut. So how do we how do we sort of begin to integrate these ideas into how we treat these diseases? Are we giving everybody like a, a smoothie with all these things in it and helping them with their immunotherapy? Yeah, well, let's take a step back to say, first of all, uh, our bodies are working hard every single day from the time we're born to our last breath to defend our health. And these defense systems, and I've identified five of them in uh, my book, uh, is angiogenesis, stem cells, our microbiome, our ability for our DNA to protect our body, protect itself and our bodies and our health, and our immunity. Right. And all these defense systems work together in concert. They're like our security force mm -hmm. in our body. They're patrolling, they're watching out, they're making sure everybody's safe inside and everything is functioning functioning smoothly. And when you have a disease like cancer, for example, and it's not just cancer, it's heart disease, it's diabetes, it's Alzheimer's, it's obesity. Um, but for specifically for cancer, it's really, you know, um, a few bad guys snuck in and they figured out how to get around the security force. You know, it's sort of like, you know, TSA slip, let somebody slip by and now we have to try to chase it. So in the old days for cancer, what we used to do is just say, well, let's, you know, um, take a drug like chemotherapy and wipe it out. And, you know, that that's a blunt instrument approach by trying to take something poison to kill something that you want to kill. By the way, the rest of you gets poisoned too. <laughs> 
Well, that's right. <laughs> and so basically, it's it's a toxic approach to uh, 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 to something that we don't really. It's one bad actor, but we don't want to poison the entire uh, body. Mm. We've now changed our minds about this, and this is really what's making the impossible possible. We've realized that it's not about drugs killing cancer. It's about our bodies taking care of itself and wiping out those cancers. So immunotherapy, which is what you were just bringing up, is an entirely new approach of enhancing our own body's defenses. We don't use drugs to kill the cancer. We allow our bodies, we give medicines that will allow our bodies to kill the, kill the cancer so our immune systems can find the cancer and reverse the disease back to health. That's what we've always been dreaming of and it's here. Mm -hmm. But here's a problem. <clears throat> Only about 20% of people actually have this incredible response to immunotherapy. Sometimes a few, a little fewer, sometimes a little bit more. But the response when it happens it's is dramatic. exactly what we want. Dramatic, right? Like your mom, it just my mom had metastatic cancer, cancer and in 30 days she had no cancer, okay? And never had chemotherapy. What about, what makes the difference between somebody who responds like that and who doesn't respond like that, right? That's, a, that's one of the mysteries out there. And this is exactly where we need to consider more than the typical um, lab tests that doctors run. We need to think more holistically. And one of the things we know is that our microbiome, our healthy gut bacteria, communicates, talks to our immune system. And, it, and we need our gut bacteria to help coach our immune system to do the right thing, including getting cancer. So. A study done by a colleague of mine, Dr. Laurence Zitvogel, uh, she's in Paris. She's an immuno, in, immunologist who uh, works with cancer patients. She looked at 249 cancer patients who were receiving immune therapies and separated them into people who responded versus people who did not respond. This, by the way, was published in the journal Science, which is one of the most prestigious yeah. journals. And what she found was that the difference between people who responded and didn't respond was one bacteria. Unbelievable. Acromancia, right? Yeah. So, well, isn't that easy? You can just maybe take some probiotics with acromancia, except that you can't. No. There's no acromancia probiotic. But you can feed them. But you can feed it. And you can actually change your gut to make your body grow acromancia. And the way to do this is the food as medicine solution. So, turns out that pomegranates and cranberries actually have elagitanins, um, but pomegranates especially. And that natural chemical in pomegranate juice. And what's been shown is that just one eight ounce cup of real pomegranate juice, not the flavored stuff, but the real stuff, yeah. actually uh, over the course of a week or two, will actually help change the inside of our guts so that that bacteria likes to grow. That bacteria grows in the lining of the gut, talks to the immune system, and that makes the cancer immunotherapy work better. Yeah, and then, and there's other things too, like, like you said, cranberries and, and green tea. Many things can actually and, feed our microbiome, right? So yeah. plant-based foods, have, you know, I think it's completely accepted now. Uh, it's not a challenge that plant-based nutrition is actually um, the healthy approach to life. I mean, it's kind of- Eating going, more plants. Eating 100%. more plants, right? But it's not just, we're not just feeding ourselves, we're feeding our bacteria, yeah. right? So we're feeding the, you know, 37 trillion bacteria in our bodies. And after we extract all the stuff that we need on the human side, we're leaving, uh, you know, the, the, the leftovers for the bacteria. And this is the fibers, this is the bioactives. And what's amazing is our bacteria can take some of this fiber and they digest it. So it's kind of like giving a sculptor a block of wood and say, do something with it. So the bacteria, our gut microbiome takes that block of wood and starts making sculptures. There's like these things called short chain fatty acids or SCAFAs that our microbiome make. And it turns out that these short chain fatty acids, these little tiny particles that they make from our food, that, yeah. that we feed them. They're like the fats that fuel the gut lining. How they do that, they're anti-inflammatory, they boost our immune system, they help regulate our blood sugar, they lower our cholesterol. Help re they, cancer risk. They, and, and they also suppress cancer risk and they um, prevent blood vessels from growing into cancer as well. All tied together. And this is, you know, at, at the end of the day, why we need to take our food seriously. Great, so um, angiogenesis is a term that I'd re uh, talks about how the body grows blood vessels. 
Blood vessels bring oxygen and nutrients to every cell in our body. That's what keeps us healthy. They what, start 60,000 60, miles. 60,000 miles. miles so if you pull out all the blood vessels <laughs> in your body, line them up, and then you can actually form a line that would go around the earth twice. Unbelievable. So that's one of this enormous organ system, right? So you know it's going to be important. And we know when you block blood vessels, like in the heart, you wind up having big problems with cardiovascular disease, clogged blood vessels lead to heart attacks and strokes. Um, and if you don't have enough blood vessels, you can't heal your wounds. And and if you actually have too many blood vessels, you can bleed in your eye, like in diabetes or macular mm -hmm. degeneration, um, and you can grow cancer, right? So this is a, a system that is required to keep every cell and organ healthy. Help keep, it's a health defense system. And if it's out of balance, you wind up either too many or too little blood vessels, you wind up having in trouble. So what are the things that can damage angiogenesis? Well, it turns out high fat diets damage angiogenesis. Any fat or just? Uh, you know what, actually mostly saturated fats, but I think that it's, you know, really high fat, overall like high fat diets are, are can be can be damaging in hypercholesterolemia, for example. If you have a lot of cholesterol floating around your blood, like the, the damaging bad cholesterol, yeah. the LDL, it actually impairs the function of these blood vessels. If you have um, second uh, cigarette smoke, tobacco yeah. you know whether your uh, people shouldn't smoke but even secondary smoke mm -hmm. can actually damage your blood vessel response and you know then you think about heart disease and you think about cancer things that are your blood vessels out of whack out of balance so the mediterranean diet has it's been a study by spain looked at um uh, elderly people on the mediterranean diet and those who uh, were on a Mediterranean diet compared to not on a Mediterranean diet had five times the number of stem cells in their circulation, in their bloodstream. Mm, so again, it's not one magic food, it's the pattern the of pattern food of that food. you're actually eating. Now, when you, you can actually do the research on specific things as well. So for example, tea, green tea will increase your stem cells, but guess what? So can black tea, mm. right? So here's what the surprise is. Japanese live forever? <laughs> well, you know. Longevity. All the green tea? You know, people in Asia drink a lot of tea. People in Britain drink a lot of tea as well. Yeah. We used to say green tea is good, black tea is fermented, so it's not going to be that good for you. We're changing our minds. We have to keep our minds open. Huh. Black tea can also double the number of stem cells. And huh. then here's another kind of surprise and delight is that um, there was a study at, uh, by UCSF in San Francisco where researchers took people with known cardiovascular disease, so they had kind of crappy blood flow, and they gave them hot chocolate. Yeah, I was going to say the chocolate stem cell story. I want to hear about that. It's amazing, that. right? So um, <laughs> the darker the chocolate, the higher the flavanols. These are the bioactives that are naturally present in cacao. Yeah. And they there was a study these done. These are the food as medicine components. This is the food There are literally component. these chemicals in food called phytochemicals or phytonutrients that actually have these medicinal properties. You're they about. are made by Mother Nature. They're packed in the food, growing on the plant. And, you know, um, every plant-based food will actually have some type of bioactive. So... In cacao, which is a bean, which then you process to you actually get, you know, kind of the cocoa powder. Um, if you take the really dark chocolate, like 73% cacao, the really dark chocolate, and you make it into a high flavanol hot chocolate drink, and you have it twice a day. This was the clinical study. They found in people who wound up actually having, um, uh, drinking the hot chocolate twice a day over the course of a month, they doubled the number of stem cells compared to the people who didn't drink hot chocolate, right? And so, okay, so the question is, is that important? Well, when they measured their blood flow, mm -hmm. what they did is they put a blood pressure cuff on them and which, you know, kind of like um, lowers the, uh, the circulation of the blood, then they let it go. They found that the blood flow was much vastly improved. Wow. So here's a functional uh, uh, result that actually means it makes a difference. So who's gonna complain about chocolate Who's going to complain about tea? Who's going to complain about a Mediterranean diet? I mean, you go out to eat. These are the things we love. We all know people that are super healthy, right? So they never get sick. And then we know people that seem to get sick all the time. The difference is probably in their microbiome. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, it was an interesting research study that looked at super healthy, super agers. You know, these are the people that um, got to their 70s and 80s and 90s um, almost without any disease at all. And then they looked at young healthy athletes and they found when they compared their microbiome they were remarkably similar they were Amazing. almost identical Amazing. so health is clearly governed by our microbiome so what are the things that we can actually eat that can be, affect them well we talked about this a little bit earlier it turns out that um, uh, pomegranates actually can make a big difference cranberries can make a big difference nuts walnuts 
pecans, cashews, things that we actually know. Almonds? Uh, almonds, yeah. Okay. And so, Just you know. Just checking, I had almonds for breakfast. I want to make sure I got it. <laughs> well, you know, we should all, we should all probably, uh, I mean, unless you have a nut allergy, I think the uh, nuts are one of the, uh, one of nature's most healthful snacks. Mm -hmm.